Sunday, January 22, 2023. Welcome to the 48th episode of The Weekend Show, where we take a deep dive into the news of the week. Please also subscribe to my daily five-minute news briefing podcast on iTunes or wherever you get yours. Joining me today is Research Associate of the Tau Knight Center News Integrity Initiative at the Craig Newmark Graduate School of Journalism. She's uh, found recent success with her podcast, Decoding Fox News, where she watches all the Fox News you'd never want to. Juliet Jeske, welcome to The Weekend Show. Thanks for having me. So uh, your podcast is kind of amazing. I think you're around the same number of episodes as I'm on with The Weekend Show, right? We've done like 46, 47 episodes. And so I think I appreciate what a commitment that is. Um, you, you're a graduate of that School mm-hmm. of Journalism. Just tell us a little bit about the, the grant that you got and, and how you are able to watch 15 hours of Fox uh, a week and decode it for your podcast listeners. Well, I kind of cut my teeth uh, researching the founder of the Proud Boys before anybody was really, a few members of the press were paying attention, but um, most of the United States, most of the people going around just had no idea who the Proud Boys were. Uh, They weren't getting a lot of press. Uh, Gavin McInnes was considered like a joke. And I knew somebody who got radicalized. I followed this person down the rabbit hole and uh, discovered the show and was horrified and started collecting clips from it and giving it to the press. And uh, I ended up capturing 407 episodes in total. The episodes are about an hour and 45 minutes long. So this was epic. It took a couple of years because um, I would do it part time. I was anonymous, not getting paid, just hated the group. And when I was in grad school, I wanted to get back to extremism And so my capstone was I watched Tucker Carlson Tonight, Nick Fuentes, and One America News Network, and then compared it to PBS and kind of was trying to show where the overlap was between Nick Fuentes and and something like Tucker Carlson and how much disinformation, misinformation they were spreading. And so when I put this capstone together, it was full of graphs and charts that showed exactly what was going on. And someone from my school who helped found my school, Jeff Jarvis, Uh, loved my capstone and kind of immediately said, we want to offer you a grant, but you have to watch Fox News. Can you watch (laughs) Fox News? And I thought, well, compared to Gavin McInnes of the Proud Boys, yes, I can watch Fox News because he was much worse. And um, it it was very funny in grad school because watching extremist media and right-wing media is considered a skill, which I thought was hilarious, that people would be like, wow, you, you can watch Fox News? And I'm like, yeah. (laughs) And <laughs> I never saw it as like a skill, but um, most people just don't want to do it. That's part of the reason why I got the gig. And I think why uh, the project has been as successful as it has been is that people want to know what's going on with Fox News, but they don't want to sit through it. We have that in common is that mm-hmm. I, I don't watch cable news as a rule, um, but I do watch Fox. And I and let's not call it Fox News, shall we? We'll just call it Fox <laughs> from this from this yeah. moment onwards. Yeah. Um, and I come from a, a country where our news is regulated in the, in the UK, meaning that it's the government re- requires the news to be nonpartisan and truthful. And so, you know, when I moved to the US and started looking at the different news offerings, and that's partly why I started Five Minute News to create a kind of, you know, unbiased version of, of the news, which people since the fairness doctrine was abolished mm-hmm. by Reagan – there's a whole generation or two generations of people that have grown up not knowing what nonpartisan fact-based news even looks like or sounds like. And I find that kind of amazing. But then again, I'm of an age where, you know, I have perspective. And I do recognize, I talk to a lot of people here in the US who have no idea that it's possible to do the news without a political leaning or where you both sides an issue just doesn't make sense to me. Do you, I mean, have you looked at news outside of the US and and seen how we do it in Europe, for example? Well, yeah, I compare Fox to PBS and PBS is public, like, you know, public radio or public television, basically. Uh, And PBS goes out of its way to not be partisan. Um, They will show, like, if they're talking about a bill, they'll have a Republican on for exactly eight minutes and then they have a Democrat on for exactly eight minutes 
Um, and I've seen the equivalent, what I have noticed is like BBC is about the equivalent of what I would call PBS, at least to an American, BBC seems straight down the middle. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so I regularly go to the BBC to find stuff. Uh, I love the BBC actually compared to, I will sometimes find clips for videos for Twitter from MSNBC or something that's clearly partisan but when it comes to my weekly analysis of the Fox shows that I cover um, with a nonpartisan choice, I always go with, with PBS because – and I've had people say PBS is liberal and I'm like, have you actually watched it? Because it's <laughs> not. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, but uh, isn't, isn't this the interesting thing about you know what's liberal and what's Republican versus what's true and what's false? Mm -hmm. And and I, I really feel like you know I do watch PBS and, and – I certainly watch the News Hour, and I'm and I'm obsessed with their frontline documentaries. But I I recognise that you know if you if you're seeking the truth, and I think that journalists inherently have a desire to seek the truth, then you'll find that in reputable news organisations, and especially these days with people like myself who are kind of independent journalists who don't answer to kind of cor corporate uh, requirements. Um, it's not like that on Fox News, though, is it? Yeah. it there isn't. It's not even journalism. It's it's like infotainment, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, they've they during the midterms, it was very telling what they were doing. They would have, they would show, uh, they'd have a a Republican uh, like person on who was running for office, a candidate on. They'd have a Republican candidate on, and they would simply go, "Well, you're amazing," and then they would show their ads in entirety like let's show your campaign ad oh wow look at that that's a great ad you're amazing and then they would like trash the democrat and i'm like how how is this news this is just this is blatant propaganda and then like sean hannity was so brazen um in the weeks before the primary i mean the midterms the weeks before the midterms he had town halls where he'd have an entire hour now normally you'd have the democrat and the republican but Hannity being Hannity would just have the Republican. So it just turned into a praise fest of like one Republican candidate. And they were very heavy handed with like Herschel Walker and Dr. Oz. Candidates were just terrible. Um, and then interestingly enough, uh, the night of the midterms, while it was still happening, <laughs> well, that was my biggest podcast ever, uh, my biggest like I got the most views for anything on that night because I a few days after it, I took all nine hours of their coverage, broke it down, turned it into a Twitter thread that was like seven t tweets long. And it was just schadenfreude. It was just, the, you know, me kind of poking fun at how they were breaking down. They just start melting down throughout the night. And before the night was over, they were trashing. They were throwing Dr. Oz under the bus and, and going after Mastriano in Pennsylvania. They just they they don't care. It's just it's to call them. I mean, that was probably the most just blatant partisan stuff I've seen on the network. They just just turned into uh, basically a campaign arm for all the Republicans. And a lot of it is down to the individual journalists or, or presenters or hosts or whatever they're called. Um, you know that they obviously are booked because of their uh, allegiance. That's the reason that they got the job is because they're, you know, pledging allegiance to the Republican Party. Most mm -hmm. of them are signed up members of the party and uh, they'll therefore do the party's bidding. And, you know, we find some of it amusing, but the seriousness is actually what we should focus on, because the, the dark side of this is that people are getting killed. Mm -hmm. You know, that there are people, whether it be, you know, COVID-19, you know, people not uh, taking the advice of Fox News rather than of uh, of Dr. Anthony Fauci and, uh, you know, them kind of weaponizing the pandemic. Uh, people die. You know, a guy goes to try and seek uh, vengeance against the FBI and, and ends up being shot dead himself. I mean, yep. this is this is the serious um, uh, side of their broadcasting and the, the dangers that go with that. Um, let's just look at some of the subjects that we'll be talking about today, because it's been a very interesting uh, week for the news. 
Um, we're going to talk about, obviously, Joe Biden and the classified documents, the disclosure that they were found in a, a private office that he'd used at the beginning of the 2020 campaign. And uh, we'll look at how that uh, compares to Donald Trump's stolen documents that he ref- refused to give back. Um, uh, there inherently lies the very difference. But we'll look at how Fox is uh, kind of delivering that message. Um, Rupert Murdoch was uh, deposed on uh, Thursday and Friday in the Dominion Voting System's $1.6 billion defamation lawsuit against Fox over its amplification of the claims that the company was involved in rigging the 2020 presidential election. So we'll take a a look at that. And um, we'll also look at how Sean Hannity and other Fox employees said they doubted Donald Trump's fraud claims, but said the opposite on air. And then finally, Trump and his lawyer have been ordered to pay a million dollars for bringing frivolous lawsuits against Hillary Clinton. Again, all stuff that has been corroborated and supported by Fox in their news broadcasts. Um, First, let's uh, talk about Rupert Murdoch, the guy who owns Fox News. Now, I think it was uh, sometime last year, wasn't it, where he At the end of last year, I think after the midterms where he realized that things weren't going so well for the Republicans with Trump's endorsement, that he warned Trump that his media empire will not back any attempt to return him to the White House. Um, And instead, you know, DeSantis is probably his his new favorite. How in the last few months of you decoding Fox News, have you recognized or witnessed the 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 agenda turning against Trump as an individual and and putting Florida's governor on on the uh, on the podium. They have been incredibly inconsistent on this, and it's been interesting because every time I think they're going to finally give up on Trump, there's a sign that they're starting to pull away. They go right back, and it's partly because of the investigations against Trump. They get weirdly defensive, and I I think. Murdoch, no matter what he says, cares more about money and ratings than anything. And if he thinks he can still continue to get the ratings and the money he's getting now, the income that he's getting now, he will he will follow Trump straight into the sun. He doesn't care. That's what I've seen, because like I've seen Ingram put a DeSantis on her show and do you know dedicate most of her show to DeSantis and praise him and praise him. Um, I think Tucker would basically turn on anyone if he thought it would help him. He doesn't seem to be that loyal to Trump. Hannity is basically connected to Trump because there's so much overlap with those two. Um, Jesse Waters, I have joked numerous times, will do anything to keep his job. Um, but even like on Fox and Friends, which is you know one of the cornerstones of Fox News, as they they have wavered a bit on Trump, but then they go right back. So it's very odd. And and other people who follow Fox have said the same thing. We can't really tell what's going on there because it's I wish I would say, oh, yeah, they've given up on him and they've but they haven't. They just still keep praising him and and will act as if what they do do. I will add this. I talked about this in a previous interview I just did. They ignore stories. So all of these investigations, everything that's gone on with Trump org, all of the lawsuits, Weisselberg, all of these cases they do not report on it. They don't mention it. They don't talk about it. It just doesn't happen. The case that he's dealing with, the defamation case where the woman accused him of sexual assault, haven't commented on it. Um, literally, the Weisselberg that just happened last week, they didn't comment on that at all. So the fact that he's going to go to to prison or jail, actually go to jail for five months, not prison, but he's going to go to jail for five months. He pled guilty. He has a plea deal basically saying, yes, I committed fraud when I worked for Trump org. And uh, he testified against the company. They didn't mention it at all. That's one so of it's the like revisionist that. history. Yeah. They 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 choose to create because I refer to it as a like a parallel universe. Yeah, where you know those of us who live in reality, who have a, a, a who've traveled, who understand how different societies operate, who know that the deep state doesn't exist yeah. in the way that it's described. <laughs> that, that they're not after your guns. Like you know, we live in we live in reality and. Alongside that is this parallel universe that is mainly created by the Fox movement, which has been going for 30 odd years, you know, since the Roger Ailes days where he saw an opportunity to kind of make money and talk radio helped with this as well. This kind of shift to the right and now 
to the far right. Let, let's just uh, talk a little bit about the number of people that watch these shows, because uh, Nielsen data for last year ranked uh, the Fox News roundtable program, The Five, which I know is a particular favorite of yours, <laughs> as, <laughs> as the most watched show in cable news with an average of three and a half million viewers. Mm-hmm. Um, that tops Tucker Carlson Tonight, which av- averaged 3.3 million viewers for the year. Um, and for the primetime show is up 3% over 2021 when it was the most watched show. That's uh, Tucker Carlson. Uh, But the five has grown uh, up 17% over the previous year. Um, Fox is the most watched cable news network for the 21st consecutive year with an average of 1.49 million viewers, a 12% gain compared with the year before. I mean, how do we equate this? Because, you know, it's the most watched, and yet I'm reading numbers out like 1.49 million and that stuff, and there's you know 330 million people mm-hmm. in the country. So how is it possible that, that with the largest share of TV viewers, they, uh, but still quite a small number, they've had such an impact on effectively 70 million people who voted for Donald Trump last time around? Yeah, it's the tip of the spear, I think, is the problem with Fox. It is even though it's only it's the numbers are cable and not, you know, if you if you compared it to network like CBS or ABC, just kind of the boring network news shows, they all beat Fox. But on cable, Fox dominates. And I think it's the tip of the spear in terms of right wing media, because all of the other right wing media follows And another thing that has huge, tremendous influence in the United States that most people don't realize is talk radio, which also taps into that same universe. And because there are countless Americans who listen to talk radio all day long, and it tends to skew very right wing. And it's the same exact rhetoric that you hear on Fox. Some of it's much harsher, Um, but it's it's very. And Sean Hannity has a radio show daily that I think is like three hours long. It's part of this whole network. And I think Fox will take something that other maybe outlets may not touch yet. But once it gets on Fox, it's legitimized and then it spreads like a virus and it goes all throughout that entire right wing ecosphere. And it's doubled down by other hosts, right? Mm -hmm. So when Hannity says it, Ingram repeats it Mm -hmm. and Tucker Carlson does it. And so you get the impression if you're one of these viewers that has it on all the time that it must be true because they're all saying it and they're all talking about it. And um, some of them, you know, the the way that news is presented, you know, as a kind of newsman, I find it really interesting. They tell you what to think. They tell you to be outraged. You know, you must be appalled. What are they doing to us? And, And making it this kind of... It's like a club, isn't it? I find this so fascinating. They talk about the viewer and themselves as if they're in the same uh, club, the same. I mean, we would call it a cult, but they (laughs) they would call it a a club, right? (laughs) And it's almost like they present all the information as if, hey, we know something that the other side doesn't know. We're sharing this private information with you. We're tipping you off. Now you're in the know. And you can go and tell people that this is what's really going on. And obviously that was very prolific during the pandemic, which is why more Republicans died of COVID than Democrats. Um, tell me a little bit about that kind of, you know, that the wink that goes with all of their, all of their delivery. Well, they call each other family. They'll say welcome right. to the family when they talk about other people on the network. And they talk about their viewers as if they're family. And then they always say things like, you won't hear this on the other networks. They're not reporting on it. And I'm just sitting there like the irony of them to say that (laughs) because they just leave out entire stories. Well, they're kind of right, aren't they? You're not going to hear it on the other networks because it's not true. It's not true. Well, because and the other thing is like the lying by omission, which is uh, an issue that I definitely deal with every single week when I analyze them, is I compare PBS and I go through a long list at the end of my my podcast that I just go through every single story that PBS reported on that Fox news did not. And it's, it's epic. It's, it's never short except for like during the holidays, it was like 12 stories instead of 25, but it's, it's one right after the other, especially anything international Fox completely ignores Um, anything that like the case of the six year old who shot his teacher, which is a recent news story that got amazing, like huge coverage. It was everywhere. Fox never mentioned it. 
not the shows I watched. It may have been on Brett Baer's show, which is like the straight news show, but it was not on the shows that people actually watch on Fox. They never mentioned it. Um, and again, anything negative about Trump, they don't mention. Anything really negative about the Republican Party, they don't mention. Um, that's just one of the ways they shape their reality is they just leave out huge sections of what's going on. And they tend to repeat the same five stories over and over again. And one of them being like the, the border crisis is constantly pushed on Fox. Crime, drugs, homelessness. And it's I could show you a segment from February of last year when I first started this to a segment from last week, especially about the border crisis. It basically look exactly the same. It would be hard to know which one was earlier. It's the same segment. And that would be the same with like drugs. It's the same with one time, true story, caught them doing this. Somebody sent it to me, actually. I wasn't actually watching this, but somebody sent because it was from a show I don't cover. But they used footage from a Ukraine of a, of a car that was all shot up. And it said in the screen, if you looked at the corner of the screen, it said Ukraine. But they used that footage during a segment about crime in L.A. And I just like your average viewer is not going to catch that that's war footage from Ukraine. They're going to think that's the crime story. It's just unbelievable. But that's what they do. And this has happened a lot, hasn't it? Like with the BLM protests, you know, mm -hmm. they kept showing over and over fire, uh, you know, one fire and was claiming it was all over, all over, you know, various places. There, there is this kind of over dramatization of the news. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, all of this, all of this criticism of the, uh, of the government and criticism of, of Democrats, it really is like a crime against the United States because nobody benefits. You know, the, the, it doesn't make the country better. It's as if they don't actually like their country. They're just grifting off the surface because there's money to be made. Um, it, does Fox do any good whatsoever? I mean, does it serve any purpose other than just to make... Rupert Murdoch rich and to keep uh, a bunch of um, unemployable hosts employed. The only thing good I would say about it, and this is not it directly, is there's a charity that runs ads on Fox called Tunnel to Towers that helps first responders who've died, their families, helps their families. And they have Tunnel to Towers on the actual news <laughs> programs a lot. Yeah. That's it. That's the only thing I would say yeah. that's positive. Let's talk about Joe Biden and the and the documents and the way that Fox has spun this to make it seem like it is the same story as Donald Trump's uh, theft of documents and refusal to return them. Um, that, in a nutshell, that's basically the difference, isn't it? That that yeah. you know Trump is claiming that he was raided by the FBI, but he's left out this kind of whole months and months where they kept asking for documents back and he refused to return them or said he didn't have any, and then uh, they effectively had to. Um, do a, a search with a warrant, not a raid, but a search with a warrant with a, a lawyer present. Mm -hmm. um, w what have you seen of that in the last few days? Because it's really coming to a head, isn't it? And as I've been watching Fox, it's all they're really talking about yeah, right now. It's their number one story. They uh, there's a couple different things they've do, they've done. The first one is they immediately pushed a conspiracy theory that Democrats concocted this and somehow planted may have planted the documents to get rid of Biden. So that was pushed immediately. And they've repeated that throughout every single show. Uh, Judge Pirro said it yesterday, and she had the gall to be like, I came up with this. And I'm like, no, yeah. you didn't. I'm working. That'll be a video that'll come out this weekend. I'm going to put one together uh, making yeah. fun of that. But that's one of them. And the second thing is they've falsely said that a vice president cannot declassify documents. I found the proof, and I found the primary source that says, yes, a vice president can declassify documents. And then they leave out the main thing they leave out with Trump is that the archives knew the documents were missing in, in Mar May of 2021. They said, hey, we know you have these. Can you give them back? And he gave them 13 boxes back. And they said, hey, we know you still have some. Can you give them back? And then he gave some more back. And then they started going, yeah, no, we know you still have more. And that's when the subpoena started. And that's when his team ignored the subpoenas and started trashing the archives and saying, oh, they're harassing us and they're corrupt and they're crooked. And and he would go out in the press and, and trash the whole process. And then finally, uh, like about a year, it was, I think it took about a year, almost a year, the, they showed up and said, give us the documents. We've been asking for these for a while now and you just refuse to give them to us. And 
you know, you have to give them to us. And that's the biggest difference is they just leave all those details out. Uh, only Republicans could paint the National Archives as a political organization. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, it's like Librarian. it's almost like a like a kind of kindergarten. You know, yeah. it's like there's just there's nothing aggressive about this organization at all. All they all they do is like file stuff. Yeah, they're nerds. Um, they're nerdy. They're, they're nerdy they're nerds, librarians. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's it's. Uh, I find that I find that endlessly entertaining. Um, Trump put out a video a couple of days ago of him uh, talking in the weirdest way, like he was high on something and he was sweating and it was a piece to camera where he was trying to you know say that Joe Biden was being treated with white gloves and yet he was you know treated so badly and you know he's his language now I mean it just makes the stuff he was saying makes n- no sense at all and I, I tweeted that video actually and I said what is this what is this hot mess even talking about <laughs> hot orange mess even talking about I mean is there going to be a point with Fox News viewers where they see this stuff from the from the disgraced former president and and they begin to realize that he really is kind of treading water and peddling everything he can because you know he's just had to drop his case against Letitia James because you know he he already got done for this this uh, court case against Hillary Clinton that, that didn't hold water and that got thrown out so he's dropped his other case i mean Almost everything that comes out of his mouth is either a lie or it's made up or it's, you know, it's it's a readjustment of the truth or rewriting the narrative. Do you think there's any moment at which either tr- um, Fox hosts or Fox viewers will be like, you know something, it's enough already with this guy? Or, or, or do you think that as long as that is, you know, he is producing cash and 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 is still entertainment because I you know I see him as just as box office really yeah but I mean, they'll just keep playing along. I have I when I worked at my capstone, I had to hunt down former Fox uh, fans who no longer liked the network. Former I, it wasn't Fox specifically, but I looked for former right wingers who'd given up on this like kind of propagandist style of media. And that was interesting to find them. It took a while because I was going on Twitter looking through hashtags of former Republican and then just contacting total strangers. And I eventually found some people and talked to them at length. And it was interesting to hear their perspective. A lot of them said it was Trump that caused them to just give up because they said they just found him exhausting. And the constant rage and the constant anger was just too much. And they thought, this is not why I'm a Republican. This is not what I wanted. I don't want this, you know, just yelling and everything's going to hell and everything's dying and America's broken. And they just got sick of the message. Now, I have seen and I'm not the only one who's reported on this, but Steve Ducey has had moments on Fox and Friends for months now where he kind of I jokingly say goes rogue. But Steve Ducey has called former President Trump crazy. He um, talked about some of his rants. He's pointed out flaws in some of the logic that Trump has used. Uh, He has had numerous instances of this. So no one's sure, and people have asked me, and I don't know, if Steve Ducey is being told to do this, if someone at Fox is like, we want one person to kind of go off script a little bit or look like you're going off script so we have some plausible accountability here um, in case we do throw this guy under the, the bus. and Or if Steve Ducey is just doing this on his own. He's been there since the start of the show. So he's very solidly entrenched at Fox. But And he's an older man who might be thinking, I want to retire. I don't know. But he... There have been numerous incidences of, of Because they know, don't yeah. they? I mean, they must know. These yeah. hosts must know yeah. that Trump is not the full ticket. They yeah. must know that he's a grifter. They must know that he is um, should never have been president in mm-hmm. terms of you know, national security. And we were very lucky that we got through those four years without World War III. Um, although you could argue that you know Ukraine, which uh, I believe is a direct result of Donald Trump's tenure, kind of is you know, becoming World War III in many ways. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just so interesting that they... Knowing how dangerous this rhetoric is, knowing that the the cost to the country as a whole is so significant that there are people that are that either self-absorbed or or just evil because they're not stupid. You know, some of them are very eloquent, but they are 
just playing a character. They're just acting. You know, they go home and go, oh, man, you know, I've got to do this again tomorrow, but I'm getting well remunerated. I mean, I just don't understand the mindset of, of the hosts that are able to continue just living a double life. Yeah, it's very twisted. Like, I think, for instance, like Tucker, I've discussed him more than anybody on that network. And uh, I think there's parts of Tucker that are 100% pure grift, where he just knows he's, uh, you you know, promoting nonsense, but it gets him ratings and it gets him fans. And then there's part of him that I think is 100% genuine. And the genuine part's the scary part, the authoritarian, you know, the autocrats that he seems to adore, like Bolsonaro and and um, the Hungarian guy. I can't remember his name off the top of my head. Um, the Hungarian. The yeah, there you go. Yeah. Um, yeah. And how he seems in Putin, quite frankly, he seems to worship these autocrats yeah. and has said many things that I would call anti-Semitic. He's promoted white nationalists repeatedly. He's promoted... Uh, you know, the the great replacement theory. I think he's a true believer. I don't think that's grift. I think he truly, having watched him for hours and hours and hours, the things he says about like, Americans are going to rise up. They're going to get fed up with this. They're not going to put up with this anymore. This is language. It's very specific that he uses over and over again. He has, what he'll do with a white nationalist is he'll plat for them, platform them in such a way as, oh, this poor person, they're beleaguered, they're being oppressed. They're being um, they're having someone come at them because of their political views and their political views are bad, but they shouldn't happen to them and they should have any political views they want. And then I Google the person and they're they're a neo-Nazi. And that's happened multiple times. Um, So I cannot I don't believe for a moment that he's just grifting for the money. I think he's a very twisted, horrible individual with very dark views and he scares the heck out of me that he's the worst one uh whereas somebody like jesse waters i honestly think if they told him hey can you promote this easter bunny for president it will you know you'll keep your job and you'll still make your millions and all of that he'll yeah sure no problem he doesn't seem to care I, I, i'm kind of interested in jesse waters because he um he you know he's like a kind of rising star in, in mm-hmm. fox isn't he and i i did some reading about him you know, he's never had another job outside of working at Fox. It's the first job he ever had. Mm-hmm. He now hosts The Five, right? He's the anchor of The he's, Five, or is he a guest host? On that? He's one of the main cast members. They rotate that cast, yeah. but the main okay. there's five kind of solid cast members, and he's one of them. And then he has his own primetime show. So, yeah. But he seems to talk with such joy you know he rubbishes people with such joy there's like it's like he's like the joker out of batman or something you know he really gets off on 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 talking people down and and this kind of far right language and you know you're right these people are very deranged but dangerous individuals and i just wonder you know people who are because we had this in England, you know, we had a we had a prime minister in David Cameron who'd only ever worked for the Conservative Party. You know, it was his first job out of university, really, and um, uh, and you know, these people become indoctrinated into that that world of of conservatism. Now, it's very different in the UK. You know, we're 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 not extreme in in the same way that right wing in America is, but it's very dangerous to have people that have not operated outside of a, a far right news organisation. They haven't had a job in the real world. They haven't interacted with people who maybe have different views to them. And so you end up with characters like Jesse Waters and uh, and Tucker Carlson who, I mean, they seem mentally ill to to me, you know. And and I I really worry that mental illness is a subject, a whole subject, that it's such an unknown quantity that it's very hard for us to kind of debate. But maybe that plays a part. Yeah, Tucker, I... I don't know what's going on with him. Uh, Other people have noticed he has a lot of creepy sexual references for no reason that are just tossed out all over the place. Um, Everyone I know who covers him talks about that. Um, The testosterone obsession, the sperm count obsession. He uses terms like spank and dungeon. I mean, he hasn't said dungeon, but he'll say in chains or, you know, like he uses all these BDSM remarks that you're like, where is this coming from? And then at the same time, which is fine. I mean, if that's his thing, that's fine. But then he also 
trashes trans people and makes trans people out to be these horrible, evil villains. And I'm like, wait a second, how can you make these other comments and then you people who are trans who are not within the binary or whatever, those people are pure evil. But I don't, you know, there's a lot of, and then Waters makes horrible comments about women. Like I have so, I could have a whole file of just Waters comments about women. And one of my most uh, biggest hits sort of, as far as my tweets are concerned, two months into my project, I was the only person who got a clip of Jesse Waters, quote unquote, joking about letting the air out of his then intern's tire so she would be forced to ask for a ride from him. He thought it was hilarious. He never said he was joking. The rest of the cast of The Five looked horrified. I clipped it. I put it on Twitter. It got a million views. It was put in 26 publications. It blew up. They addressed it openly on air. They didn't say who I was, but they said, we were joking. He said he was joking. So I slapped yeah, that's always their up. defense, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, I just joked up and I slapped up the whole clip, a longer clip and said, where's the joke? I don't see the joke. Right. So it was one of those things where and he said, oh, uh, liberal women should get married. So they'll vote Republican. He's made so many comments about women. I can't even tell you. And it's. And uh, I'm not the only one that's noticed. So it's like there's some weird issue with both of them. But I, I I think Jesse Waters isn't as much of a true believer as someone who will do whatever he is told to get the ratings up and to keep people watching his show. That's He seems more um, hungry for that, whereas Tucker, I think, is truly a twisted individual. And I, I don't know what's going on with him. And Tucker also tries to... Uh, present himself as a blue collar or salt of the earth, which is so laughable because he comes from tremendous wealth. His stepmother was an heiress. His father worked in broadcasting. He went to boarding school and elite colleges. So it's like, or college, he went to one college, but he went to an elite college. But like boarding school alone in the United States, that's not, most people do not go to boarding school. It's very expensive. And it's just, it's just not something your average American could afford or do. So yeah, he's, he's very, very privileged, but he acts like he's, you know, like, I'm just a working man. Well, Trump does the same thing, oh, right? yeah. trying yeah. to pretend that he's a man of the people when yeah. obviously he was born into privilege. He was given a fortune by his father, which, uh, you know, he, he, he then kind of made some horrific business decisions with yeah. and managed, <laughs> managed to avoid national service. Um, mm-hmm. let's, let's talk about the kind of brainwashing, because this is a word that I think we kind of underuse when it comes to the 70 million people that voted for Trump and many of whom I'm sure are Fox viewers. Um, There's obviously brainwashing that goes on at Fox HQ. And we should also mention Newsmax and uh, One America. And I mean, in fact, I looked on, I have this uh, app called Pluto, I think, and it shows me all different news channels. And I didn't realize how many far right channels there are. Um, it's not just the the big three. There, mm-hmm. There's probably at least six or seven of these channels that are all repeating this kind of language. America's Voice, I think, mm-hmm. is one of them. And right, and and so so they they you know it's it's in addition to talk radio as you describe. I mean, there is a huge amount of brainwashing going on. Let's just talk about the viewers for a moment. You know, the the, the how people digest this stuff. Now, I don't have a huge connection to people or any people since the pandemic. I haven't really left the house, but I just live in here. But I, my landlord is a is a Fox viewer and a Trump supporter. And 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 weirdly, you know, he should be a, a liberal, right? You know, he's in show business and he, he's one of the nicest guys I ever met. But he just goes, I'm, I'm a conservative. I'm just a conservative. And, and I've tried to kind of talk to him about the brainwashing and he refused to get vaccinated and, you know, all, all this all this stuff. And he sends me links from uh, <laughs> Rumble and places on the internet that I didn't even know existed. Um, tries to tell me that, uh, you know, he, he knows. He knows. He's tipping me off. You know, he's just tipping me off. And again, that's the whole brainwashing thing. I mean, you must have come into contact with with family members or friends or people who are being brainwashed by this and have been radicalized. You know, it's a huge number of people. It's a large percentage of the United States. Mm-hmm. And how do we how do we even attempt to try and right some of these wrongs or bring these people back to reality? Or is are we just fooling ourselves if we think we can help people? I think I think more needs to be done. I think. Part of the problem with the rest of media 
is for too long, Fox was treated like just another channel. And people just went, oh, you know, it's just another point of view. And they didn't realize how misleading the information was, how false it was, how empty it was, how it's just, again, the same five stories pushed over and over again, and how blatantly partisan it is of just like never showing a Democrat, always trashing Democrats, always having Republicans on and just praising them, um, basically just campaigning for them. And I think the biggest mistake the rest of media has made, and I think they're starting to wake up now in the past few years, they're starting to wake up, is to treat Fox like it was a normal network, and it's not. And um, also, I think some media with both sides in gets a little stupid. Um, I, I'm going to go back to PBS. Like I've Try to explain to people who don't watch PBS what I mean when I say they are not partisan. I go, well, they're not going to show a climate change denialist. They're not. They don't do that. Um, they'll, sh- you know, they don't. They're not crazy. They'll just show like a boring moderate Republican talk about like the Inflation Reduction Act, and then they'll have kind of a boring Democrat talk about the same bill. That's what they do. They don't have extremists on. They don't give them a voice. And when they had a very fascinating episode the the night that Roe v. Wade was overturned. Um, they had people from both sides of the issue come on. But what I explained to someone on Twitter who was arguing with me over it, I said one thing they did not do, which was excellent reporting in my opinion, is they didn't let these people soapbox. They asked them very specific questions like, what are you going to do now? What do pregnant people do now? What do people who, you know, have an unwanted pregnancy, who can they turn to? How can you help them? What is your organization going to do to help them? And this was to a lot of the anti-abortion groups. And they were very respectful and calm. And they treated them with reverence. They weren't nasty to them. They didn't argue with them. That's what I meant by nonpartisan. And they let the people speak. And I thought by, you know, and they were, again, there was plenty of, oh, we're so excited that this got overturned. You know, of course there was. But they didn't let them like soapbox. They didn't say, here's the mic, talk for five minutes. Yeah. They still conducted it. You know, they still, you know, made it go along a path. They didn't just say, tell us about how birth control is, is evil and terrible and going to kill women. You know, like the stuff that the propaganda that you'll see on the Internet. So that's how you can do it. And I think the problem that has happened too long with media is the loudest voices get the most attention. And sometimes right. the loudest voices are the craziest voices. Yeah. And giving those people equal time is like, don't do that. Like that, I think, is irresponsible. So it's similar in the emergency room. This might be a strange analogy, but like the people that are sitting in the emergency room screaming because they're in pain are the ones that the triage people don't worry about so much. Mm-hmm. It's the ones that are sitting quietly who haven't really moved. They're the ones that need to be fast tracked in, you know, to see a doctor. And, and you know, the, the media is it's so fragmented and it's it's so vast. And obviously social media and Facebook and all that play such a huge part in this. But uh, and, and I'm kind of answering my own question in as much as, you know, I don't think it is possible to kind of save people because I don't think this is a partisan issue. It's not left and right. Um, it is about true and false. It is about what is fair and what is reality and what is this kind of, I don't even know what it is, the upside down that these people live in. Mm -hmm. Um, Do you think that it's even possible to convince Fox viewers that they are living in the upside down, that that there might be an an alternative reality that they would actually lead a better life in, where that they wouldn't be so angry all the time, where they're more likely to have representation that actually cares about them? What I've seen is, uh, and my I have a friend who has training in psychology and she has de-radicalized people. Um, they've come to her asking for help, basically. And she's also worked with like former Proud Boys. And the key to that is it's so hard because if you're related to the person, it's almost impossible to do it. Because they know you way too well and they can push all your buttons in an instant and there's way too much shared history there. If you don't know the person that well, the best way to try to pull them away from this is to be – it's it's so difficult. You have to remain incredibly calm and respectful and you can't try to fight them or outlogic them because they will just maneuver around that and say, well, see, that's fake. That's fake. That's fake. 
But if you sit them down and actually make them spell out what they actually believe, often when they're trying to do that, they realize, wait a second, what I actually believe is kind of nonsense. And that's what she has found. My friend, Samantha Kuttner, she's um, well known in the extremist circles, but what she has found is, is weirdly is showing compassion, being incredibly patient and not fighting with them works better than anything, even though it takes a very long time and it doesn't always work. And like I said, if you are like it's if it's your mother or your your husband or, you know, a sibling, it's much harder because they're they have hooks into you that you can't even see. And I have a relative. I won't say who this relative is or how I'm related to this person, but I have a relative who's gone down these rabbit holes and it is very, very frustrating. Um it's affected the whole family and the whole family gets frustrated with it. And our way of navigating it is we just, when this person is in the room, we just don't talk about anything political. It just, we clam up immediately. And uh, it's very difficult because this person will insert politics into things that we weren't even talking, you know, talk about the weather and that this person will find a way <laughs> to start screaming about uh, supply side economics or something. You don't understand. You've been, because this person calls my family brainwashed. You know, right. Yeah. Well, let's let's refer to that for a second, because there is a lot of criticism from the right that that CNN or MSNBC is is biased and is extreme. um, Let's just talk about, you know, their coverage. They are considered the two main kind of left leaning or liberal networks. Um, You know, I, I don't watch them religiously, but obviously I dip in and out. And the thing that frustrates me about them is the is the drama. You know, this kind of high drama. That's not the way I was taught to do the news. And and I think that by having a countdown clock on the screen all the time to when, you know, I don't know when the, the, the debt ceiling gets reached or something is is probably not helpful for one's heart rate. But how do you feel the, the, the left leaning media figure in this in this kind of news landscape? I have mixed feelings about them and about the coverage. There's times where I, you know, enjoy it. And there's times where I just go, what are you doing? Um, I, it, yeah, it just, God, that's a hard question to answer because like I listen to Pod Save America a lot and I love that show. Um, but that is clearly a partisan show and they make no bones about it. They're not trying to be like news. It's like, this yeah. is a partisan podcast. Well, they're former Obama speech yeah. writers. So you know so, exactly what yeah. you're getting with them. Yeah. So to me, that's a little bit different because it's like they're not trying to be objective journalists. But there's times with MSNBC where I kind of go, I I don't know if this is helping or hurting. You know, I, mm. I, I don't know. It When it gets very heavy handed, there's times where I'm not a huge fan. But I've also gotten very disgusted by extremism in general from studying extremism because when you see it. It's much, much, much worse on the right. It's like 100 to 1. The ratio would be completely unbalanced. But when you see it on the left, it's equally troubling. When somebody, uh, for instance, deep state, that concept is pushed both on the extreme left and the extreme right. And I've seen uh, the Frank Rich conspiracy theory was pushed on the extreme left and the extreme right. And some of the weird Russia stuff that like pro-Russia is pushed on both extremes and so I'm just not a fan of extremism. I'm not a fan of screaming at people. I'm not a fan of scolding them when they don't agree with you. I, I think that's just completely unnecessary and it doesn't help at all. Like the lead up to 2020 when uh, very – I'm not going to name any candidate, but there were some candidates whose followers were vicious. If you didn't agree with them, even if you were also a Democrat, even if you were also on the same – sort of side of the spectrum. If you didn't agree with every single policy they stood for, they would come at you and scream at you and post and incredibly nasty stuff and you'd just be hounded. And I would stop and go, how do you think you're going to win an election like this? You're not going to win anything. You have to persuade people. But it's people. uncivilized, isn't yeah, it? And that's a word I use a lot on this program to describe what I experience in the U.S. Certainly when it comes to a six-year-old shooting a teacher. Um and 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 men trying to tell women what they can do with their bodies. I mean, it's just fundamentally uncivilized. And I and I do think the U.S. is an uncivilized country, far more so than say some even I don't know 
countries that you would have considered what what Donald Trump would refer to as shithole countries yeah, yeah. that are actually yeah. far more civilized yeah. than than the U.S. But there is this kind of exceptionalism here, where people are so are told so many times by Fox and and similar that they're you know that Americans are the greatest and it's the greatest country and and this very kind of patriotic attitude towards the country without actually getting into the weeds of it and mm-hmm. looking at how bad education is here or looking at how few rights people have here or or you know the 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 divide just in terms of between men and women i mean it's very gendered fox as well isn't it you oh know, yeah the, the women are all very you know done up like there's that wonderful movie bombshell yeah. right is that what it's called yeah. about about old fox news yeah and megan yeah. kelly and that whole movement and it's that's worth a watch, isn't it? If you want to kind of get educated on the on the history of that, the kind of misogynistic side of Fox. Well, the the joke is when I used to work as an actor, even though I have zero desire to go back to that profession ever again, I was told all the time that I looked like a Republican, and I would get <laughs> cast. I would get cast as a Republican. I was play lawyers, FBI. And I would, uh, they would always say stuff like, oh, you look, I even have, was even told more than once that I looked like a Fox anchor and I would just laugh my head off. Now it's even funnier um, because I'm like, well, I am a natural blonde, so maybe not, you know, because they're like (laughs) super blonde, but, um, and tan, they're so tan. I don't tan at all. I'm like an Irish person. I just, we just stay the same. But it's all very unnatural on screen, isn't it? Oh, yeah. You know, the way that... The way that people sit and the way that they talk to each other, yeah. there's, there's nothing natural about it. And and again, the dresses, I, don't, I just the think dresses. that, uh, yeah, and the alarm <laughs> bells are, don't seem to be going off enough in, in the viewer's mind. Yeah. Um, let's just talk about the, the kind of interview process here, because I, I recognize certainly in, in Europe, politicians have to go on the news of all political persuasions, because that is a functioning democracy to have a journalist interview you. And to try and really question you, the journalist is acting in the best interests of the country as a whole, representing the voters. And and so I think politicians recognize that they have to be interviewed because that is a functioning democracy. It doesn't happen, as you've alluded to on Fox, it just doesn't happen. But when it happens on CNN or MSNBC... I'd, I feel, as a as an interviewer, that the the right questions are not being asked, even by kind of liberal hosts against, you know, Democrats or or Republicans, and and it's very frustrating for me, you know, because here's an example: our Prime Minister in the UK, uh, Rishi Sunak, uh, a couple of days ago got hit with a. A citation for not wearing a seatbelt because someone photographed him in the back of the uh, the prime minister's car sliding around on the leather seat and not wearing a belt, and he got he got a fine. <laughs> I mean, you know, that's that we we try and hold everybody to the same standard. It doesn't always work, and you know, I'm not saying the UK is necessarily better. It's just different. So, how do you feel when you see hosts kind of miss opportunities to kind of really uh, interview or interrogate or or you know, make the most of this opportunity to to interview politicians? I think the thing I see the most, and um, I know a lot of people have complained about this, is they don't push back. It, so right. if, if the politician basically doesn't answer the question, I just saw a British person interview your prime minister. It was a clip. And it was, it was a Scottish, Scottish guy, wasn't it? A Scottish guy, yeah. And yeah, he just I, I posted not, that. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I saw that. I, I was like, yeah. woo and you yeah. had a comment like, if this was in America, this would be like a scandal. And the right. Scottish reporter just would not let up because the prime minister was not answering the question. And you will occasionally see that in the in, in the United States. You'll occasionally see a reporter who will just just, you know, double down and not give up. But too often the attitude is, well, you can't, you know, if they don't answer the question, you just keep going. And yeah. you want access, you want access. You don't want you don't want to lose access. So there's this panic of if they're too hard on the politician, that the politicians won't agree to their interviews anymore or they'll look rude or something. And it's like, I think the biggest problem is like I can't tell you how many times I've been watching an interview and they ask a point blank question and the politician does not answer the question. They give us some fancy dance around and they just move on. And I'm on this right. end going, no, 
keep going. Yeah. Keep, yeah. He didn't answer the question. And that's probably the biggest. Yeah, I would completely agree with you. That's I have a huge beef with that. That's a huge problem in American media. There's this sense. But of, even NPR does that. And I yeah. think part of the problem is that they have pre-written questions in a stack. And you put the you ask that question, then you put it at the back of the stack. And you know, in my experience, you only need one piece of paper or one <laughs> card with the first question on it. And, yeah. and that's all you need. Because yeah. if, if you truly want to get to the bottom of a subject, then yeah, exactly as you say, you have to have follow up questions that occur to you at the time. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, it's just I don't know, it's, you know, I, I don't want to kind of tell people how to do their jobs. That's not in my interest. But I just from a democracy perspective, the, you know, having Uh, Political parties that oppose each other, that is part of democracy because one has to call the other one out. But outside of that, we need journalists to be able to ask probing questions and get answers. And and that is part of of a functioning democracy. Um, So you could argue that there is not a functioning democracy here in the the United States. It's limping. Um, it's limping. Let, let, <laughs> let's let's talk about um, this Dominion voting machine thing very quickly because I, I do think this is absolutely fascinating. And when I heard that Dominion, who you know they they make the voting machines that were used in in many of the districts for for voting, electronic counting and that type of stuff, that they were like, you know, we're done listening to Fox rubbishing our machines, which are you know that are, are have worked for decades and work all over the world and there's nothing wrong with our with our counting machines that they were like okay screw it we're just going to sue fox and and so that is kind of a, an ongoing case and um the the company contends that fox news personalities continue to highlight the election claims even after it warned the network that they were false and unfounded mm-hmm. um and uh, sydney powell you may remember the world's greatest uh, lawyer <laughs> Uh, she <laughs> she uh, is the one that was saying that these Dominion uh, machines were had been tampered with by China and by Venezuela and Hugo Chavez and this this whole like conspiracy theory. And I was like, wow, like, you know, she's Trump's lawyer. She's on. She's part of the campaign. I mean, you know. How is this? I mean, how is this going to change Fox viewers' minds? Because Dominion will probably win this case, I presume, because all the evidence is on videotape. It's not like it's just hearsay. Mm-hmm. Um, do you think it will go any way to kind of making people realize that stuff that's said on Fox is not true? I don't think it will change the audience. I think Fox News might change some of its rhetoric a little bit if they really right. truly have a huge payout to this company and they may have one a lot of people think that they may have one yeah they might be a little bit more careful about some of the stuff they throw uh for instance last night tucker carlson made a blatantly false statement when he said nixon had the largest margin of victory in a presidential election ever and that's just, just patently false it was lyndon b johnson and then uh Franklin Delano Roosevelt were above Nixon and Nixon only got that one election and it was in 1972. They'll still say stuff like that because no one's going to sue over that. But so they'll still say lies. They'll still lie to their audience directly. But when it comes to smearing individuals or corporations, they might actually stop doing that if they get hit with this huge settlement because other people can, once they see Deep, they have very deep pockets. Uh, plenty of lawyers would work on contingency, meaning they'll get a percentage of the settlement. And they know they'll get a lot of fame and a lot of other clients out of it, a lot of publicity. So I think if they get hit with this huge settlement, I think they're opening the door for more lawsuits. And uh, the Frank Rich, they settled. Uh, they had to settle with the Frank Rich family over blatantly lying about his death over and over and over again. So, I, yeah, I think they're just going to I think I think that that's the only thing that will shift is if they get hit with like multi millions of dollars, like hundreds of millions of dollars in a settlement, they might actually go, wait a second, we should probably put a muzzle on some of this. Um, but I don't the viewers will just be they'll go down straight to the pits of hell with that network. They the people who love Fox will never see it. They, and that's the thing about being in a cult, isn't it? Yeah. And then being radicalized yeah. is that you're supreme leader whether that's you know 
Sean Hannity or Tucker Carlson, that the, the, whatever the leader says or does, even if they change their story, it's still gospel. And, and I guess that's what happened with Donald Trump. You know, he has been so contradictory with, with so many of the things that he, he said, and, and yet people will just jump on the Trump train no matter where it's heading. Do you, I, I actually believe that through a kind of fate of terrible circumstances, Donald Trump could end up winning again in 2024. Yeah. And I don't mind saying that out loud. I posted it on Twitter the other day and people were kind of angry with me for, for saying that. But, you know, here's the reality. And this, what I basically said is that, um, you know, the, the, the Justice Department and Merrick Garland are taking their sweet merry time about prosecuting him. Yeah. Uh, they're kind of both sides in thing now, I know, both sides I know. in the issue. And, and that's so frustrating, isn't it? Uh, and then you'll find that he'll probably cut a deal with Ron DeSantis, probably pay him like $20 million to kind of go away and not not run for president. And then just the disorganization of the Republican Party will mean that Trump will end up being the de facto leader and uh, will end up running. And Joe Biden is 82 and is increasingly struggling um, physically, uh, only compared to Trump. I think he still has all his marbles, but he has a speech impediment. He's not a great public speaker. And Trump is obviously better at that as more of a showman and a a comedian, entertainer. Um, So Trump at TV debates could end up really pummeling Joe Biden. And, you know, he'll just lie his way through it and say that everything was better under Trump, referring to himself in the third person, which I find quite distressing. And then the next thing you'll know, he'll win by a hair. I mean, I'm worried of the same thing. And it, yeah. when I appeared on uh, the podcast with the Lincoln Project, some of my uh, followers got very angry with me because they're like super progressive. And from the day the Lincoln Project was formed, I said, this is great. We need it because we need Republicans who are against this craziness. And I feel like all hands on deck, if it means moderates, former Republicans going against Trump, we need everything we can get going against Trump. And that's the one thing that I try not to show my politics in my work. Um, Like, I don't preach to my audience. I don't say you have to agree with me. I try to not do that in my podcast. I try to just show how crazy Fox is. I might joke about it. I might make fun of them, but I don't go... Like you should vote this way or uh, like I just talked about abortion a couple weeks ago and I tried I did not in- put my opinion on it. I just said this is what they said. This is what blah, 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 blah. Did not push it uh, because I want my podcast to be open to as many people as possible uh, because I want to show what Fox is. But I believe uh, like I won't hold back if someone said, do you think tr- I think Trump is a criminal? I think he tried to overthrow the U.S. government on January 6th, even though it was a completely half-baked attempt that didn't make quite a bit of sense. But I I just cannot, I will not show objectivity when it comes to him. Absolutely not. I just think it's he's a clear and present danger to our country and he needs to be stopped. And I think I, I have very strong feelings. I would agree with you that it is possible that he could become president again and we cannot become complacent. And Biden is Biden. He's always had gaffes. He's always been imperfect. He's always been Biden, you know, uh, but, and he very well might be the candidate. And if that's the case, we, well, we got to do what we got to do. And if that means, you know, double down as much as we can on anti-Trump, then that's what we got to do. Cause it's not, I don't view Republicans as evil. I don't view Democrats as perfect. I just view it as uh, Trump is not a Republican. Trump is Trump. And he's a clear and present danger to our democracy. I just can't hold that. I cannot hold that in. So I would I would feel like, especially after January 6th, and I think what's so frustrating about the American political uh, process is it was written at a time that was very, they didn't really, you know, the founding fathers are kind of worshipped in the United States, and I'm not sure why, because they're flawed people just like anybody else. And like the way we impeach a president is ridiculous. It, we just can't get rid of, like, parliament you don't like the, your person, we, you can get rid of them. As you, we just saw, you've had so many prime ministers in the past five years. It's like, boom, boom, boom. In the United States, it's like, uh, it's like impossible to get rid of these people. And uh, this, these investigations by Merrick Garland are way too long. The January 6th committee was just, you know, I thought they did a great job, but it was just such a long, drawn out process. And Americans just give up. They stop paying attention and they'll forget very quickly 
and they'll see this guy up there with his bravado and, you know, swinging around and yeah, I'm going to make America great. And there's a portion of our electorate that will just go, OK, yeah, I like that guy. It's crazy. So, yeah, long answer. Sorry. Very complicated answer. No, but, I mean, it's yeah. it's you say what I feel. And, and I think that, you know, many people never predicted that Donald Trump would be elected in the first place. They thought it was a done deal for Hillary. And uh, they regretted that they didn't take this more seriously, the threat of fascism more seriously. And yeah. and, and it's important to call it what it is, because, yeah. you know, uh, I would just finish by saying that, um, you know, there's the story out this week about they can't find the leaker from the Supreme Court, uh, Roe v. Wade, o overturning uh, ruling. Um, and Donald Trump put out a, a thing on Truth Social that said, uh, arrest every journalist from Politico that, you know, that, that ran this story and interrogate them and then you'll find out who did it. And, you know, he, he was advocating for, for fascism to, yeah. to arrest journalists. And, you know, it really is as simple as that. And, and that's why it's ironic that Fox, they claim to be journalists and yet their supreme leader is, is very kind of anti-journalist and to kind of coin the phrase enemy of the people when referring to yeah. a free press, that is in itself you know the 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 makings of a of a dictator that cares only for himself and will stop at nothing to kind of uh, bring the country down and we we saw that so I, I feel your pain and you know the, the the struggle is real yeah yeah I agree completely yeah it's 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 scary I mean I I it's one of the things that gets me through my job though is I feel like I have to kind of do it feels like I have to do this work if I can at least get some people to turn away from this or prevent one of the things with the cutting Fox News, I think it helps prevent people who are close to the edge of slipping into that right. from going over because we'll show yeah. you that they're lying to you over and over and over again. We I always say we when I talk about my project, I'm like, I am the project. <laughs> well, it's a it's a it's a crusade. And, you know, <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I feel the same with the work I do. Like it's a, it's it's necessary mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, and it's it's important. Uh, listen, I, I'm very grateful to you for joining us today, and I wish you every success with Decoding Fox News, uh, the podcast, and when you write it up. And I, I fingers crossed that you're going to do something great when your when your project ends, and you'll be on to the next thing. I have no doubt you'll do great. Thank you so much, Juliet Jeske. Thank you for joining us here on the Weekend Show. Please subscribe on YouTube or as an audio podcast, and also the Five Minute News Daily Podcast, which drops every morning, so you can hear me tell you about the day's news while you make your coffee. Join me next week with a brand new special guest and three more factual news stories to discuss on the 5-Minute News Weekend Show with Midas Touch.